particles uh, have different qualities to them. We spoke about the source that appears in Chumash Vayikra, where it discusses uh, carbonos that were cooked in uh, different kinds of utensils. In other words, what happens if a carbon is cooked in a metal utensil? So the Torah tells us that after the period of time during which the carbon can be eaten has passed, or as we're past the deadline, and the carbon can no longer be eaten, the utensil has to be dealt with because the utensil has absorbed this microscopic essence that we mentioned last week, this tom, into its walls. So if it's a metal utensil, so the Torah tells us it can be dealt with by extracting the tom from the pot, from the walls of the pot, and therefore you can now use the pot for anything else. But if it is not a metal pot, if it is an earthenware, I'll just call it earthenware for right now, if it is an earthenware utensil, so then the only thing that can be done to it, or the only thing that will enable you to use it again, is to break it. In other words, there's no way to completely get the tom, to completely get that microscopic essence that's been absorbed into the walls of an earthenware utensil, there's no way to get that out of the utensil. Why? We don't know. Torah tells us. Right? The Torah tells us that's the nature of earthenware, what we call in Hebrew cheres. Right? Sometimes cheres is translated as pottery, ceramic. These are all uh, similar kinds of terms. We'll try to understand them a little bit more today. But this idea of uh, pottery, cheres, uh, earthenware, the Torah itself tells us that it doesn't exude what it has absorbed. So there's no way to kosher it because I can't possibly get it out of the walls of that kli. Okay? So uh, that translates not only from carbonos, but that translates into kashras as well. Meaning that if I use a pot and I cook something which isn't kosher in a pot, so I need to remove from the walls of the pot that microscopic essence that the pot has absorbed, that tom that the pot has absorbed. How do I do that? I do that if it's a metal pot, through the mechanism, the same way in which it got absorbed into the pot, that's the way in which it comes out from the pot, right? That's an expression that we use in kashras. Essentially, kibolo, the way in which it was absorbed, kach polto, that's the way in which it comes out. So if I cooked um, my, I don't know, treif mac and cheese, in a pot, uh, how did my treif mac and cheese get absorbed into the walls of the pot? Through the medium of a hot liquid. Because what's the hot liquid? Whatever is in the mac and cheese that's liquid that you know, ultimately makes it cook, whether it's milk or whether it's water, whatever it is, there's a hot liquid. The hot liquid was the way in which the Tom of the trafe mac and cheese got into the walls of the pot. Good. How do I get the wall? How do I get the trafe, the tom of the trafe mac and cheese, which is in the walls of the pot? How do I get it out of the walls of the pot? A liquid also, meaning I let the pot sit for 24 hours, then I fill the pot with water and I boil the water. The water pulls out whatever tom is in the walls of the pot and, and uh, the water nullifies whatever tom comes into it from the walls of the pot because the water, the pot is filled, we say the water is 60 times the amount of the volume of the walls of the pot. Good, okay. That's if I have a metal pot. Well, you put in water and then you boil it. In other words, it has to reach the temperature. It has to reach the same temperature that it reached to 
put things in. In other words, whatever that, whatever you cooked in there, right? You cooked that trafe mac and cheese that it reached a certain temperature. So that's the same temperature that you're going to need to get it, to get the tom out of the walls of the pot. Okay, good. So that's if, that's if I use a, if I have a pot and I use the, uh, a liquid, a hot liquid to transfer the tom. What if I didn't use a hot liquid to transfer the what if I transferred the tom directly onto the utensil? How could that be? A metal, a metal We're talking metal utensil right now. How would you do that? How would I do that? How would I do that? I take a frying pan. And what do I do on my frying pan? On my frying pan, I decide that I'm going to fry some uh, sausage. I think the sausage is a uh, kosher sausage. And sure enough, turns out I made a mistake in the store. It's not kosher sausage. It, it's not the vegetarian sausage I thought it was. It's the, uh, it's treif sausage, it's treif sausage. But the sausage and the frying pan were in direct contact with each other. Now it is true, maybe I sprayed some uh, Pam or something on the, on the frying pan, but the bottom line is that there was direct contact between the food and the frying pan. There was not a medium of a liquid that was present. So there was direct absorption of the food, of the hot food into the frying pan. So how do I get that in? I can. It's just complicated. All right, how do I get it out? Anybody know? Blowtorch. Okay, blowtorch. Right, you, you never heard of koshering anything with a blowtorch? Right, how do you, right, what's the idea? How are you going to kosher this frying pan? So you have to heat up the frying pan to the same, at least the same temperature that it was heated up to when it absorbed the tom that was there. How do you do that? How do you do that? So that's where the halacha says you need to have a direct heat source on the frying pan. And you have to make the frying pan red hot. So you can't make a frying pan red hot on the stove. That's not going to help. How do you make a frying pan red hot? It's with a blowtorch. Make a frying pan red hot with a blowtorch. There's two problems with this. Number one, it's dangerous, right? It is, it's very, it's very dangerous. Number two, it's going to ruin your pan, right? Number two, it's going to ruin your pan. So how do you cash your frying pan? Oh, okay. So Brenda, so Brenda is suggesting, Brenda is suggesting that we have a modern day equivalent to a blowtorch that is safer to use and distributes heat more evenly than a blowtorch. And that is a self-clean oven, right? A self-cleaning oven reaches a very high temperature. I believe it's 900, 800, 900, very hot temperature. And if you can take your frying pan, put it in your self-cleaning oven, then assuming that it's still a frying pan when the <laughs> oven is finished, you could use it, right? Now, again, you have to be very careful here of several things. First of all, that you don't damage the oven because sometimes your uh, self-cleaning ovens, the warranty is void if you self-clean with something in the oven. So you don't wanna damage your oven. Number two, if your pot has, if your frying pan has like a plastic handle, not a good idea, right? Because if your frying pan has a plastic handle, that will obviously melt uh, in the oven and probably the self-clean cycle will discolor um, the frying pan. However, uh, it, could, it could work. I, I've seen it done with an iron skillet. 
right? Cast iron. Cast iron skillet. If you have a cast iron skillet that has become not kosher, so cast iron skillet in a self cleaning oven, just laugh. They laugh at each other, right? It's not a problem at all. So, so that's the equivalent of the blowtorch. Now, kosherous agencies still use blowtorches when they go, let's say, into a trade kitchen and they're going to kosher things in the kitchen. They're going to kosher the oven. Right? They're going to kosher an oven in the kitchen. So we want to kosher an oven for Pesach, or we want to kosher an oven in between milchiks and Pleshiks. So we can kosher an oven. How do we kosher an oven? If it's self-clean oven, you run it through a self-clean cycle. That koshers the oven. It's so hot, it koshers the oven. What if it's not a self-clean oven? You wait 24 hours. You have to wait 24 hours. You have to clean it with a caustic cleaner. And then you have to turn it up to the highest temperature it's ever been at for as long as it's ever been. All right, that, that's how you kosher a regular oven. When, when kosher's agencies come into a, uh, into a commercial establishment, they don't have time to do that. So what, how do they kosher the oven? Well, they kosher the oven with a blowtorch, but they don't use a blowtorch like, you know, we use a blowtorch. They use a blowtorch, which is a, a big blowtorch connected to a propane tank, right? This huge blowtorch, and they literally are able to burn out the entire oven with this huge blowtorch, and that's how they do it. Okay, so that's if it's a Ghostbusters. That's if it's a that's if it's a utensil that can be kosher. But what if it's a utensil that can't be kosher? Because we can't pull the tom out of it, like cheres. We can't pull the tom out of cheres, out of this pottery, this earthenware. We learn that by carbonos. It's the same thing by any time that gets absorbed into it. We can't pull it out. So if we can't pull it out, what do we do? It's finished. Can't use it. I mean, you could use it maybe to display fruit. You could put a nice doily on it, but you can't use it for anything hot. You can't use it for anything hot. Um, there is one, one possible way of koshering it, right? One possible way of koshering it, and that is to do the self-cleaning oven trick on this piece of earthenware. Now, that's a little bit complicated. It's complicated because it might break. This earthenware piece that you have might break. So, you, you know, you have to just no going into it that it might break. Um, if you really need to kosher it and you don't want to use your self-cleaning oven, you should take it to a kiln, right? I, I've had families who have become balei tshuva and they've had not kosher earthenware. Uh, and what they've done is they've taken this earthenware to a potter who refires all of the earthenware in a kiln. Now, this will take us a little bit into our discussion of China, okay? So, not the country. China, not the country. <laughs> China, not the country. Well, China, China, partly the country. That's how the dishes got their name. You know that. Why are, why are China dishes called China? China dishes are called China because the clay from which they were originally made came from China, right? So they call them China. That's it. Anyway, so let's just talk for a moment about these things because it's a little bit confusing. Ceramic, right? Porcelain. What are, what are these things? So there are items that are subsumed under this general category of either ceramic uh, slash porcelain, what we call cheres. So I want you to think about them as follows. There is earthenware. There's stoneware, and there's China, right? Or China is really what's porcelain. called porcelain, right? Earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain slash China. What are these things? What are these things? Any of you have earthenware dishes? Earth, so how do they, how do they, all three of these things are made in the same fundamental way. They are made from 
materials from the earth, they are um, put together, right? And usually through the method of some liquid or something, they're put together and they are then fired in an oven called a kiln. Have any of you ever made pottery? Yes. So that's, this, that's what this is, right? Pottery, you take your clay and you shape it into whatever you want and then you put it in the kiln. What does the kiln do? At a very high temperature, the kiln transforms this clay object into a solid object. Right, this clay object into a solid object. Now, what's the problem with it now? So, in all likelihood, if you drop it on the floor, it's going to shatter because it's not, it's not considered very strong. Right, this is earthenware. It's not considered very strong. And it's very absorbent. If you were to cook something in earthenware, it whatever you cooked in the earthenware would be completely absorbed in the earthenware. The earthenware would be discolored. And generally, earthenware is not used for cooking kinds of purposes. It's used for decorative purposes, not used for cooking kinds of purposes. Any of you have stoneware dishes? <laughs> right? When I, when I got married, I first got married, I had stoneware dishes. Okay? Stoneware. What are stoneware dishes? So they are made from a different material than earthenware, and they are fired to the point where they become vitrified. You hear that expression? Which I never did until I researched this. Until they become vitrified, which basically means V-I-T-rified, all right? Which basically means that they're heated to such an extent that the um, all of the moisture is pulled out. They become very solid and they develop a kind of sheen, a kind of sheen, like a glaze on top of them. Okay? <coughs> They're more durable. Stoneware is more durable than earthenware. And stoneware is actually used for, uh, not for cooking so much, but used as plates, uh, dishes, things like that. And then there is something called porcelain sat slash china. Porcelain slash china, what is that? That is a special kind of clay mixture that came from this place in China, which now is available, right? We have it all over the world, but it's still called China because that's where it came from. Uh, that is, uh, fired multiple times at very high temperatures that is completely vitrified and that is coated with a uh, coated with a uh, glaze to it okay now what's bone china what's bone china yes bone china is more expensive but what makes it bone china? Well, what makes it bone china is because there is bone in it. Animal bone. Animal bone in bone china. Right? Animal, animal bone in bone china. In order for it to be in order for it to be considered bone china in the United States, the requirement is that it has to have 25% of bone ash. 25% of its composition has to be bone ash. Now, wait a second. Does that mean that I'm eating my, I'm eating my dinner on uh, the bones of a, I don't know, who knows, a cow, a pig, or whatever? Right? So the, ans so the answer is, I don't have to worry about it. Why don't I have to worry about it? Because it's bone ash. In other words, the bones are completely burnt. They become ash. Right? Once they are completely burnt and they become ash, they lose their identity. It doesn't matter if it was a pig bone, if it was a, 
a giraffe bone, I don't know, what a hippopotamus bone, it's irrelevant, right? They, it, they lose, it loses its identity, right? But that's what makes it bone china, right? Now you know why it's so expensive. Now, something even more interesting and a little bit weird is that bone china in other countries can actually have human bone ash in it. So you could theoretically be eating dinner on Aunt Bessie, right? In other words, in certain places, they make <laughs> China out of the remains of people who were cremated, right? There is human bone ash in China. Now, okay, all right, now, now, let me ask you a question. If China, if porcelain slash China and stoneware and earthenware are all made in fundamentally the same way and they are absorbent, right? They should be absorbent. So we would have a problem kashring them, right? Because they're, that's klicheris. That's what the Torah tells us. So that applies to certainly earthenware, but stoneware and particularly china and especially bone china have a glass-like coating that is fired onto the china. In other words, after that china has become hardened, they then take a glass, it's actually like a liquid glass, and they fire it onto the china, which helps to make it not absorbent. So if it's not absorbent, so then why can't we use it? And if it's not absorbent, isn't it like isn't it like glass? Right? Shouldn't it be like glass? Why do we treat China differently than we treat glass? So the halacha says that glass by itself Glass formed by itself is one entity. Glass which is melted onto another object, um, glass which is melted onto another object assumes the quality of the object onto which it's absorbed. So the glass melted onto the china becomes halachically like the china. Right? Whereas regular glass is glass. Regular glass is glass. So as a result of that, China that becomes trafed up, you can't use it. You can't use it. Okay? Stoneware that becomes trafed up, you can't use it. Earthenware that becomes trafed up, you can't use it. You can have it rekilled, and sometimes it's worth it. Right? Sometimes it is worth taking your you know, your, your Alta Bubby's uh, very expensive china that you're not sure what she used it for and having it rekilled because china is very expensive, right? So sometimes it's worth it. Rav Moshe actually has a tshuva. It's an interesting tshuva. Rav Moshe writes that in the case of a bal tshuva, right, someone who has, you know, a full set of china that they use for something that was treif, and it would be a tremendous loss for them, financially, uh, and also emotionally, if they had to throw out this china. So Rav Moshe is lenient in this particular circumstance, that if it's allowed to sit for a year, it can then be immersed in boiling water to kosher it. And indeed, there are times when we rely on this head to. There are some rabbis who rely on this heter more than the particular case that Rav Moshe mentioned, and will tell you that if you trafed up a piece of china, that's what you can do, right? I'm not comfortable with that, right? I think that if you, you know, it depends how much of a financial loss it's going to be. Um, but so those are those, so that's, that's what we're talking about here when it comes to klicheres. That's the klicheres and its kashras component, okay? Kli that we're talking about here is in a tuma and tahara perspective. 
And Kli Cheres has a very interesting status to it. We learn from a Kashrus perspective, it's very stringent, right? From a Kashrus perspective, if my piece of Cheres becomes in some way treif because it absorbs the tam of something, I can't kasher it, or it's very difficult to kasher, nearly impossible to kasher. But when it comes to the laws of Tumantara, klicheres has an interesting quality to it. And what is that? So uh, let's, let's imagine, okay, we're, we're all in a room and there's a dead body in the room. Okay, you all look awake, it's a good sign. There's a dead body in the room. And in the room, there's, uh, uh, let's say, utensils. And those utensils are filled with uh, food or drink. Okay? What's the status of those utensils? And what's the status of the food inside of them? Not treif. We're not talking about kosher and treif here. We're talking about tahor and tame. What's the status? They're, they're all covered. They all, have, they all have covers on top. They're fine, says Brenda. Okay, they're fine. Anybody want to disagree with Brenda? All right, so it all depends on what they're made out of. If they are made out of, let's say, metal, so we have the following. When a person dies, a Jewish person dies in a room, the air of the room transmits the tumor from this dead body. As long as it's in a contained area, it transmits the tumor from this dead body, right? And that air carries the tumor from the dead body to any utensil that is there. So if I have a metal pot and my metal pot has cholent in it and it's uncovered, it becomes tummy. But even if it's covered, it becomes tummy. Why? Because as soon as this tumor, which is being transmitted through the air, touches the outside of the pot, the pot becomes tummy. Once the pot becomes tummy, the food inside the pot becomes tummy. Even okay? Without heat, even without communicating it with, with Tuma and Tara do not need heat. It's Heat is only kosher, right? Tumantara is exposure, right? If I'm exposed, is that cold? Right? <laughs> well, it must have been, it may have gone up higher than the thermostat would say. It says it's heat, but I'm gonna raise the setting. Well, freeze. <laughs> Let's see, hopefully it will get warmer. Okay. What if you have a plant in there? Does the plant get thrown out too? No, wait a second. So again, remember, Tumantara today, right, Tumantara today. Nothing. But it, uh, we don't do it, I mean, we're all tummy. Everything is tummy today, right? Everything, everything is tummy, right? So Tumantara, I'm talking about a time where Tumantara, should I shut it off, by the way? Talking about a time when Tumantara were more, Relevant. Sadly, today they're not relevant to us. Hopefully, tomorrow, when the base of English is built, it will be more relevant to us. But right now, it's not so relevant to us, right? But yes, you got a pot in a house, so it would become it would become tummy, right? The pot would become tummy. The food inside would become tummy, unless it was in a cheres pot. Unless it was in a cheres pot. In a, in a earthenware, stoneware, or porcelain slash china pot. Why? Because when it comes to tuma, this kind of substance has an advantage. And what is that advantage? That advantage is it can only become tame from the inside. It can't become tame from the outside. Right? Every other pot, every metal pot, I'm just going to show up. Every metal pot that we have lying there. It's going to go on. 
The question is, is it going to go up or is it going to snow first? Okay. So, right. So, so only if, only if the tuma that's being transmitted through the air can get inside of this klicheres, can it be metame the klicheres? <clears throat> but if the klicheres is sealed, so then whatever is the klicheres itself and whatever is in the klicheres does not become tam. It's not sealed today. If it's not sealed, and, and the tuma has a way of getting into the interior of it, then it becomes tummy, but otherwise it doesn't, right? Why? Because the Torah tells us, right? That the Torah, I mean, these, these laws of tuma and tara are, are not always easy for us to understand. They're not always, many of them are logical, but not all of them are rational, logical for us to understand. So that's what the Torah tells us about a klicheres. We have to assume it has something to do with the nature of the material and the way in which a klicheres is made. So as long as I have a klicheres and it's sealed, then whatever is in it, as well as it, does not become tame, because it can't become tame from the outside of it, okay? So let me show you that. Let's look, uh, let's look inside, page 840. We're still on page 840. By right, page 840, okay, Pasuk 15. <laughs> I know you feel, right? Right, Pasuk 15. V'cho kli fatuach, right? Any open vessel, right? Any open vessel. Asher ein tzamid pasil alav, that does not have a covering sealed on it, tamehu. It is tame. Such a utensil is tame. Says Rashi, if you look down at Rashi, Rashi is in the left column, the third line. Rashi says, v'chok khalifa suach, says Rashi, bekli cheres hakasav medaber. What's the Torah talking about? A klicheres. It's talking about a <coughs> a pottery, right? a piece of pottery, or earthenware, or stoneware, or china. But klicheres akasuv medaber she'ain mikabel tuma migabo, because klicheres doesn't become tame from the outside. Migabo is from the outside. Ella mitocho. It only becomes tame if the tuma has a way of being transmitted to the interior, to the inside of the, of the utensil. Lefichach, im ein magofes tzmidaso psula alav yafa bechibor tamehu. If it's not sealed tightly, and there's a way for the outside air, which is transmitting this tuma to get inside of it, then it becomes tame. Otherwise, if it has this seal over it, so then it's fine. Then it is Tahor. You can only use earthenware. what? Only earthenware. Only earthenware. Any other kind of utensil in the um, in the house becomes tummy. There is one exception. It's an interesting exception, and that is actual stone, not stoneware but actual stone utensils, mm -hmm. but actual stone utensils. Stone utensils do not become tame. Stone utensils do not become tame. And interestingly, that's, that is when they do archeological excavations, they find in Yerushalayim, they find stone utensils. Mm -hmm. I went to, sorry, Rabbi, I went to visit Iran and I saw stone pots. Stone I mean, pots. Stone pots. Not stoneware, stone right? Stone, stone pots. Stone pots, and it's divided inside, so they can put all kind of food in one Interesting. Pot. Yeah. Right, stone, stone, stone does not become tummy. So the Kohanim used to eat with stone utensils, right, to avoid the possibility of tumma, right? So there, so there are stone utensils. So 
So stone would not become tummy, but most people don't have actual stone utensils. In fact, even our countertops that we think are stone are sometimes not pure stone. Right? Sometimes they're not pure stone, right? Um, so so uh, stone would not become tummy, but any other kind of utensil that was there, that's there would become tummy. And the food inside of it would become tummy as well. So glass, we say glass has this special status to it that glass doesn't absorb. All right, so since glass doesn't absorb, what happens with Tuma? I'm not sure about Tuma. Not sure if, I'm not sure how Tuma affects glass. An interesting question, I'm not sure. Pyrex is what Pyrex? So Pyrex, Pyrex is treated halachically like glass. Right? Pyrex is treated halachically like glass. Okay? Now, the, different, the, the difference is, if I'm an Ashkenazi, remember yeah. we learned, right? I'm an Ashkenazi, yeah. so I can't use glass to cook with. Meaning I can't use, I can't use Pyrex to cook both milchix and fleshix, obviously not at the same time. But if I'm a Sephardi, I can. Right? If I'm a Sephardi, I can, obviously not at the same time. But if I'm a Sephardi and I have a Pyrex dish, I can use Pyrex to, uh, to cook uh, something, your meat, and then I can use Pyrex to cook dairy. I just have to clean it out in between, right? Ashkenazim don't have such luxuries, right? We, uh, you know, we don't get to do that, right? So, um, yes. Is microwave no, because because what happens is I, I assume you're referring to the fact that the heat that it's the food the food that gets heated and not the utensil that gets heated. However, generally when you cook something in a microwave, the utensil is hot. The utensil is hot because the food is hot in a microwave. Because the food is hot in the microwave. Interesting question about the glass of a microwave. Can you use the glass? The glass. The glass uh, turntable, turn can you use it for both milchix and fleshix? I'll leave that, I'll leave that up in the air, right? Ask your local Orthodox rabbi. Okay. But you don't put food directly on it, but maybe food spills over. I mean, whenever I do something in the right way, inevitably food spills over. So, uh, Okay, so, so the Torah tells us that if you have this, in the house, in the ohel, where a person has died, you have a uh, a kli cheres, which is not sealed, then it becomes tummy. But otherwise, if it's sealed, it doesn't become tummy, and whatever is inside of it doesn't become tummy. Okay. Then the Torah goes back. We spoke about ohel. Now the Torah goes back to a case of pure touch. And the Torah says in verse Tes, tes Zion, and anything he shall touch in the open field. The body, a body, a corpse that was killed by the sword. Oh, or a just a corpse that wasn't killed by the sword, but that died in some other way. Adam, or the bone of a person, O Bekever, or a grave, Yitma Shivas Yami. What happens? That you are Tame for seven days. Meaning, if you touch, if I'm in a room with a dead body, if I, I'm sorry, if I'm in a room with a Jewish corpse, I'm Tame. If I'm in a field with a Jewish corpse, on the street with a Jewish corpse, so I don't become Tame unless I touch the corpse. What about right? wars? What about when they have the wars in, when the temple is built? People would so, have to, right? If, does that incapacitate the army, though, when it happens? Or only, they, it doesn't incapacitate the army. The army just had, the uh, soldiers have to go through a process of power. Exactly. Right, they have to go, th and and in those days it was much different. In those days, when you killed somebody, you were up close and personal. Right. 
right? Today, you you know, in war, they kill people. You don't even, you know, they don't even know it's people, right? They don't even know it's people, right? So, but but if you would, if you had a sword and you killed somebody with a sword, you would become tough, okay? Now, um, or not only not only a, a corpse, but um, a bone, a, a bone from a person. If you touch a bone of a person, you become tame. Not obviously a bone of an animal, but a bone of a person, you become tame. Uh, or if you touch a kever, you touch a grave, so then you become tame. And that tuma is a tuma of shivas yamin of seven seven days. Now there's a very interesting uh, Rashi here. Look at the Rashi, four lines up from the bottom in the left column, al Pineha Sadeh. So Rashi, you know, sometimes Rashi gets very involved in, uh, in diktuk, in grammar, and sometimes he tells it to us and sometimes he doesn't. So this interpretation of Rashi here is based on grammar. Raboseinu Darshu, the rabbis understood this, lirabos, to include golel vidofek, a golel vidofek. What's a golel and what's a dofek? A golel is the top of the coffin, right? The top, that, that enclosure with that board on the top of the coffin, that's called a golel. <clears throat> a dofek is the wall of a coffin, right? The wall of a coffin, right? Probably terms that we're not familiar with. Right, well, dofek and dofen, maybe they're related, but dofek, right? It's not dafnot. Right? It's not dofen, it's dofen. Okay, so that's the, those are the walls of the, of the coffin, of the casket. So if a person touches the casket, he or she becomes tummy. You touch the top of it, if you touch the sides of it, you become tummy. Now certainly the people who are carrying it become tummy, right? But, but you might say, well, the person is inside and the person is sealed off Right? So if the person is inside and the person is sealed off, I'm not touching the person. You're right, you're not touching the person, but we learn that you become tame not only through touching a corpse, but you also become tame through carrying a corpse. And when you carry the casket, you are carrying the corpse without touching it. So anybody who's carrying the corpse becomes tame in this process. But even if you're not carrying the corpse, let's say you just put your hand on the casket, put your hand on the coffin. People do that all the time. Put their hand on the coffin, put their hand on the casket, you become tough. Two must mace, seven days. Now, again, we don't think about it because we're all tummy mace. But that's, right, two must mace, seven days, that's what happens. This phrase that Rashi introduces, right, this idea that Lerabos, the Pasa, comes to include these things. Where's Rashi getting it from? He's getting it from the strange grammar of the Pasa. Because the Pasa begins by saying, And whoever touches, comma, in an open field, comma, whatever. What should follow right after whoever touches? Whoever touches a particular thing. I don't know, I'm not a grammar person, but there's a, there's a word for that, all right? <clears throat> the, the verb has to, has to be attached to something. Whatever it's called, I don't know. But what, in, in, normal, in normal usage, the verb and what it's attached to are in proximity to each other. They're not, there's not something separating them. Here, something is separating between the verb and its object. And that causes the rabbis to say, well, the Torah is coming, to, trying to teach me something else. And that's according to the way Rashi understands it, quoting the rabbis, le rabos es hagolil de es Okay, now, here's the question. So you know that before that when someone dies, right, someone dies, and it's one of the relatives for whom you are responsible, one of the seven relatives for whom you are responsible, and you're notified of the death, 
So the moment you are notified of the death, you become an Onin, mm -hmm. right? You are in this most intense period of mourning. You're not allowed to eat meat. You're not allowed to drink wine. And you are obligated to observe most of the laws of Shiva already, not all of them. You don't have to wear non-leather shoes. You don't have to sit in a low chair. But other than that, the laws of Shiva apply to you already. That's an Oni. When do you go to the tank and say Rahul? Correct. You're exempt from all positive, from all mitzvahs ase, Right. You're exempt from all mitzvahs ase. What? After the burial, you make you have to make brachot after the burial. Okay, now, so here's, so here's the question. You become an onain the minute you're informed that that's someone of those seven relatives has died. Let's say nobody tells you. What are you going to know? It happened to me. Right? Nobody tells you. You're not in Avelis. Yes. Right? And sometimes we actually <laughs> employ that. Meaning, let's say, let's say that uh, I'm making a chasana, right? I'm making a wedding and my, one of my relatives, one of those seven relatives is in the hospital dying. So it's feasible and it, it, it's actually sometimes practiced where we'll tell people do not call the son, right? When the mother dies, don't call the son because he's in the middle of the chasana. Don't call the son. As long as nobody tells him, as long as nobody tells him, then he doesn't know. And if he doesn't know, his avelis doesn't start. After the chasana, someone tells him and his avelis starts at that point. I don't know if any of you have ever been in similar kinds of situations. <laughs> What? My father, when I was tomorrow's father, my son, his brother passed away in South Africa, and that's what we told him. We said, don't ask the questions till after that. Okay. And, yeah. Okay, so that's, right, I don't even remember. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> right, so that's, that sometimes we rely on because your Avelis begins when you hear. Now, very interesting. Let's say that you hear a week later, Right? You know, the other, other part of the family is in California. You're not so in touch with them. Person dies there. You didn't hear until a week has passed. What's your obligation then when you hear? No, nope. you have to sit Shiva. Really? If you hear a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, you have to sit Shiva up till a month. Up till a month. If you hear any time up to a month, even if you hear the day 29, you have to sit Shiva for a full week. Mm -hmm. If you hear after a month has elapsed, you sit Shiva for one day. If you hear after a month has elapsed, you sit Shiva for one day. And, and people actually use this if we have extraordinary circumstances. In other words, let's say we have someone, an elderly person, who can't, who can't sit Shiva, can't, right? So then you would tell that person that one of his or her relatives has passed away an hour before the beginning of a Yom Tov, right? Because then, okay, that person's obligated to sit Shiva that day, sits Shiva for 10 minutes, and Yom Tov cancels Shiva. So it's a compassionate death. Correct. So in other words, that's, that's what's called a Shmua Rachoka. Let's say you hear five years later. Mm -hmm. Happens. You hear five years later that, that one of your relatives died. One day. one day. One day. There is another time where you sit Shiva for one day. Anybody know what that is? Pinui Atzamos. Pinui Atzamos is when you disinter someone. Let's say you want to move someone to Israel. <clears throat> you disinter a body or whatever's left, and you transport that body to, to Israel. So there is a minhag that on the day of the disinterment, because, the, because of the disturbance which is created, you observe 
one day of Avelis, some of quasi kind of Avelis, okay? So that's another situation. Pinui atzamot. Pinui atzamot. Um, now, back to our Golel question. When do I transition from being an Onain to being an Avel? When do I transition from being an Onain to being an Avel? Okay, after the funeral, right? But after the funeral is not so precise, right? Remember, we're Jews, right? We, Shabbos doesn't begin when it gets, right? This is the time, this is when it's over, right? This is if you live here, if you live here, this zip code, that zip code, this shul, that shul. Okay, uh, so when, when precisely during the burial do, does the transition between Aninus and Avelus start? Nope, no, no. no. It's called when there is stimat ha golel. The same word golel that Rashi uses here to refer to the top of the coffin, when there is stimat ha golel, when, when that is closed, right? Now, it doesn't mean when the coffin, when the, when the top is put on top, but it means when the grave is filled in. Did you ever notice that at the very end of filling in the grave, you want to make sure that the earth is higher than the surrounding ground mm -hmm. and somebody will actually create a mound right. in the middle. Mm -hmm. That's the technical point of stima tagome, right? That's why people who leave the cemetery, you know, they'll take a, you know, a few handfuls of earth and throw it into the grave and then leave their Avelis hasn't begun yet because the grave hasn't been filled in. There hasn't been stima tagola. Okay, and there are different opinions as to how much of the grave has to be filled in for there to be stima tagola. But this word golel that Rashi brings down here to tell us that if you touch a, if you touch a casket, if you touch the top or you touch the sides of the casket, so you become tummy even without carrying the mace, even without touching the mace, you become tummy. That word golel actually is a halachic important, has halachic significance for when avelus, when mourning begins, right? It doesn't begin when you walk through the line. You're already an avel when you walk through the line. It begins when that final uh, act of burial is done. And that has nothing to do with the rabbi speaking. That has nothing to do with the Kel Mali Rachamim. Has nothing to do with anything other than the earth physically being placed into the, into the grave. And it doesn't matter if the earth is placed into the grave, you know, through uh, people shoveling it in, which is ideally how we do it, right? Sometimes it's too, I've been at, I've been at funerals where the earth is too frozen, right? To do that, you can't. Lives that they were up in Vermont and they could not actually bury for months. Could not bury for months. months. Correct. I mean, that happens. Because she's not Jewish, but what would one do? Because one right. becomes. That, um, that, right? So that actually happens. So what do you, uh, because the earth is so frozen that you can't dig a grave. Even the machines can't dig a grave. You have to go back and rebury and bury like months later. You right. have to go back up to Vermont and bury. Yeah. So, so what, what, um, what we would all, in all likelihood say is that you give the body over. It's an interesting, Kay, I'm, you know, interesting thing to think about. You give the body over to someone else who assumes responsibility for it. And once you give the body over to someone else who assumes responsibility for it, that's when you begin Shiva. But I think that might only work if there was, let's say, a Hebra Kadisha that would, mm -hmm. that would, that would take right. responsibility for it. I'm interesting. I don't know if it would work with a non-Jewish funeral home. It's an interesting question. Um, it, for instance, if someone, let's say, is getting buried in Israel and you're not going, okay? So when that cargo door closes and the body is inside, that's when your Avelis begins, okay? You know, right there at the airport, that's where your Avelis begins even though the person won't be buried for another... So when you can no longer assume any responsibility for the body, that's when your mourning period starts. In other words, 
bodies in the plane, you can't do any more. Correct. That's correct. So at that point, or, you're or done. even if you even if you hand it over to a Hebra Kadisha. Right. But if you hand it over to a Hebra Kadisha to bury and they're going to take care of everything and you're not going to be involved with it, that's when your Avelis begins. Okay? That's when your Avelis begins. Okay. So I, I it's an interesting question. I, I you know. actually went back. Yeah, it's an interest. It's an interesting question. Well, the body, the they bodies are kept down. in, you know, like they're kept in refrigeration, and but even in refrigeration, they they ultimately deteriorate. Um, I, it's an interesting question. I have to ask Rabbi Zom. To ask Rabbi Zom what one would do, and I mean, I, it's it's not conceivable that you would be an Onain for months. That's not conceivable. So uh, somehow there has to be a transfer of responsibility to to someone else, you know, then if you go up to the burial, interesting question. But it does happen, but I was referring to a case where I've been at, I've been at funerals where you can't fill it by hand because it's too, the earth which they've dug out mm -hmm. is too frozen, right? It's frozen solid on top. Mm -hmm. And you can only cover, you can only fill the grave by a machine, right? So you fill the grave by a machine, that's what you do. Right? That's what you do. Okay, that's by the way, this is why um, you can't have unveilings in the winter because they can't, they, they say they can't set the, every stone that you have, mon, you know, every monument at the cemetery doesn't just sit on the earth. It actually sits on a base of concrete that is poured into, you know, into a form in the earth so that it's stable, so that it doesn't, you know, you go to a very old cemetery, you'll notice that the headstones are sometimes this way, that way, you know, because the earth shifts, right? And earth shifts and, uh, uh, you know, if it, if it shifts, I mean, we all, this is not something that we really relate to because we have homes with foundations and everything else. But if you have a country house that's built on concrete piers, so if those concrete piers are not set properly, you know, over time, your house begins to shift and walls crack and things like that. Okay, so back to, so back to here. So the Pasuk tells us that if you touch the, uh, obviously, if you touch the body, we've learned that already, but if you touch the instrument that killed the body, and in the case which Tar mentions here, it's a cherub, it's a sword, but it could be anything. Or if you, if you touch that instrument that killed the body or that killed the person, uh, or you touch a bone of the person, or you touch the grave, so then, um, so then you become Tame for seven days. You become Tame for seven days. Um, the, and again, how do, you, how do you get out of this tumma? So that's the process that we mentioned before, and that is the ashes of the paraduma. Pasuk 17, the Torah says, v'lakchu latame me'afar sreifas hachatas. You take, right, for the person who has become tuma, tame through tumas meis, you take from the, um, the afar, it's interesting, how do you say ashes? Ashes are a fair with an olive, right? Ashes are a fair with an olive. In fact, if you look above, let's see. Yes, look, look just at the top of the page on the third line. Uh, last word on that third line, v'chibes ha'osef es a fair ha'para, right? Es a fair ha'para. Here, what's it referred to? Here, it's referred to uh, afar, right? It said, Torah tells us, v'lachu latamei. May afar srefas hachatas, right from the afar, which is the earth um, of this uh, burnt uh, para aduma, referred to here as a chatas. Vinasan alav mayim chayim el keli. And what do you do? You put mayim chayim on top of it in a kli, in a in a utensil. So this is the first step in the tahara process. You take the ashes, right, that is mixed with the earth, because remember where they burn the paraduma, when they scoop everything up, there's earth that's there as well. So you take the earth and the ashes of the paraduma, and you pour mayim chayim on top of that in a kli, right, in a utensil, right? You make this mixture. Um, What's the recipe? How, me, how much of the ashes do I need to use? 
How much water can I use? Do the ashes become diluted in the water? Right? We learned that if I use, if there's 60 times whatever fell into the pot, in the pot, so then whatever fell in becomes nullified under normal circumstances. Do, do I have to make sure that I put in less than 50 times, less than 60 times the amount of water in this, in this cleat? So we're gonna talk about all of those things. Um, and I, so I, I create this mixture and then I take v'lakach a zov. I take an a zov. What is a zov? Hyssop, right? Hyssop, right? A lowly growing, it's a, it's a kind of vegetation, might be a plant, I'm not sure, a kind of vegetation that grows close to the ground. Hyssop. So I take the hyssop. Vitaval um, bamayim ishtahor, and a pure person dips the hyssop into the mixture. Vihiza al haohel, and he sprinkles it on the tent. Vial kol hakelim, and on all of the utensils. Vial ha nefashos asher hayusham, and on the people who were there. Vial ha nogeya, and on the person who touched. <coughs> Okay, so the hyssop becomes like a, uh, I don't know what to call sprayer. it, like a sprayer, like a sponge, like a paintbrush, right? That you dip the hyssop into the water, <coughs> water and ashes mixture, and then you sprinkle that on the person. How much has to be sprinkled on the person? Torah doesn't tell us. I sprinkle just a little bit. Let's say I get one drop. So am I tell her with one drop? Yeah. Okay. Or do I need more? Right? Do I need to actually feel sprinkle? <coughs> right? Do I need to actually feel sprinkle? What if they sprinkle towards me and it doesn't hit me? So am I am I sprinkled or not sprinkled? Right? So again, the the Torah doesn't tell us any of these things. We only know them through Torah Shabbat. We only know them through Torah Shabbat. When is the sprinkling done? So that's the next puzzle. V'hizah ha-tahor al ha-tamei v'yom ha-shlishi v'yom ha-shvi Done on the third day and on the seventh day. V'chit'o v'yom ha-shvi And he becomes purified on the seventh day. V'chibes b'gadav And he immerses his clothing v'rachatz b'samayim And he immerses himself in the water. Tahir by Arab, and when evening comes, he becomes pure. Okay, that's the process of purification. The details of that process, Emir Tzashem, will go through next week. Okay, uh, next week, are we okay for class? Or not okay for class? No problem. January. First week in January, no problem. No problem. Good. Excuse me, everybody. Sorry, Rabbi. Tonight, uh, the mother of uh, Yossi Hazan from Big and the House of the Warrior. The mother is uh, giving the uh, brachot in uh, Rabbi Avram from Henshaw. So please, everybody, and she needs support. She needs support.